Um, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I have a slightly different view on uh, what's uh, going on in terms of transition. Um, and I'm, I'm, I have different uh, um, ideological reaction to marketization politics as well, as is probably obvious from the title of the book. Um, the book is built partly on my PhD that was completed five years ago, and of course a lot has changed in Ukraine since. I have been working on class analysis in Ukraine for a little while. Um, and then when um, the uh, revolution of dignity uh, has happened, which I refer to as the bloody winter in my book, I will explain that in a minute. Um, I was a little bit baffled, just like everybody else was, because even though I saw a lot of inequalities, I saw a lot of turmoil, I saw protests, I didn't think it would break into a civil armed conflict. I didn't envisage that happening. I just didn't think Ukrainians have it in them to start killing each other. And I was perplexed with, uh, and, and was trying to understand how did we get to this point? People do not start killing each other instantly. Some, something has to build up. Right? So I try to explain in this book, how did we get to the point of breaking into an armed conflict? What has happened? I try to historicize the roots of this conflict. And what I try to show, unlike a lot of other analysis that try to go with this east-west binary, buffer zone, neglected land, I try to bring the agency of social forces on the ground center stage. I, find, I, I get a little frustrated reading about you know, Russia confronting US on the border of Ukraine and all of that kind of thing. Where, what is Ukraine? Where are Ukrainians in all of this? Do they not have, maybe we can you know, debate about um, how their subjectivity perhaps is vacant or it is uh, manipulated, but they still do have agency, don't they? Why don't we give them a little bit of a credit? Uh, they are not empty puppets. So what exactly has happened there? The way I describe it in my book is I do not look at I, I, I find I do not look at the empire, Russian empire, you know this you know new, new confrontation between the Russian Empire and the uh, in the Russia to, the, the Russian Empire and the U.S. Empire and all of that kind of thing. Geopolitics is present and it's very important. What is different, however, to say mid 20th century is the underlying class structure of that confrontation and the ideological component of that confrontation. We're not talking about the socialist world fighting a capitalist world. We're talking about two big capitalist economies and, and classes that are behind them uh, competing uh, for accumulation of capital and zones of economic control at the end of the day. Yes, politics is important. Yes, uh, culture is important. But the underlying problem there is the uh, accumulation rivalries between various fractions and classes, uh, sorry, fractions of capitalist class. So, uh, what then happened in Ukraine coming to a transition? And why, why Ukraine deteriorated into this, um, into this conflict? The reason, uh, the, the reason uh, for that I see in, um, in the inability to resolve socioeconomic depravity and growing inequality in the country by the ruling oligarchy, of course, with, uh, the, with the Western and, and Eastern component, because we have relationships with international financial institutions, we have economic dependency on, uh, on Russian gas, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, we have, um, we have the, uh, the regime of neoliberal kleptocracy being constructed. While Europe was very busy, while the EU was very busy, correction, EU and Europe are different things, while the EU was very busy with Central Eastern European states, uh, and Russia was uh, busy recovering from the, the transition shock therapy, and it wouldn't have recovered if it didn't have oil and gas, let's not kid ourselves here. It's not because they're so fantastic and innovative and everything else. Let's remember the curse of oil. Um, so while the, while the areas of economic, input, economic influence that are, are those poles that are pulling Ukraine apart in a way now, while they were busy somewhere else, Ukraine had, in Ukraine there was this time and space for the local oligarchy, local capital to grow. Right? Because everybody else was a little bit, didn't have enough time to watch what was happening in Ukraine. And of course, this, and Oleg described it 
uh, already as well. You know, these the the oligarchs they didn't emerge overnight. They were in formation for a while, and I would I, I go as as far back as you know 70s and 80s. You know, especially the 80s with the emergence of, of cooperatives. Cooperatives were already the antecedents of capitalist relationships, because you could create surplus value already through cooperatives. Um, and in the process of the dissolution of USSR. Uh, uh, of course, uh, again, uh, was already mentioned, we didn't have new people necessarily come into the structures of power. They were all the same people overseeing the process of privatization. And what happens is that uh, I utilize here uh, Shelley and Godson's concept of criminal political nexus. Uh, the economic forces that were in the shadow or semi-shadow through cooperatives previously could now come out of that shadow to the extent it was convenient for them and start accumulating privatizing enterprises. And of course, the so-called red directors and neo-nomenclatura were best positioned for accumulation of those assets. That was them. They were the political part of the criminal political nexus. There was also the criminal part. During the Soviet times, they were operating uh, shadow economy, and security officials, party officials would, would cover up for them and get a share of uh, profit, if you like. With privatization now, and through the process of uh, capitalist, uh, of primitive accumulation and then concentration of capital in financial industrial groups, we have the balance of power shifting in that nexus, where we have gangsters turned oligarchs going to politics proper. Or Yanukovych and Akhmeta are the, the, your prime examples. The whole party of region, uh, uh, creme de la creme, they came from very violent gangs. The process of primitive accumulation in, in Donbass was very primitive indeed. There was a accumulation by crime. People were killed on unprecedented rate. Uh, in about 1994, there were about five to six ordered killings per week uh, in Donetsk Oblast. That was, uh, that was an annual average in some other regions. So that's, that's the, kind of, um, the kind we're talking about. But we have this shift of power. And, that, um, and that, uh, that, so the criminals, cl criminals turned politicians, oligarch turned politicians now were in charge of the security forces who used to cover for them. In Russia, that kind of complex also existed, but that, sh that, 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 that shift in the balance of power didn't quite happen. So you have KGB running the state-run oligarchy. Uh, but that's, that's a separate matter. So what we have, like in the process of this violent accumulation and then concentration of capital throughout the 90s, uh, you have new nomenclatura lose their reins of power to an extent, and this new, uh, new political forces come into place. Uh, uh, but at the same time, in this process of accumulation, of course, very little, uh, so money gets concentrated in very few hands. Yes, you get those expensive houses appearing and cars and everything, but they're concentrated in, in, very, in a very small amount of hands, right? The rest of people, they're, they're, they're dispossessed masses, as I repl as I as, uh, or the labor, uh, as I call them in the book they are getting progressively uh, more socioeconomically disadvantaged. And not only, we were here, we don't only need to look at the wages, we need to look at the whole system of social reproduction that underpins survival on an everyday basis. Colin Williams' work on subsistence economy here is very good. Oksana Duchak told us already today about how important it is all these indirect subsidies that the state still provides so that the accumulation of capital can happen in enterprises. And that is something that you will not find in economic statistics. That is not something that figures in big, in big tables. And that is something that's a big chunk of Ukrainian economy. That's a buffer that allows, uh, that allows for, the system, for the system of neoliberal kleptocracy to survive. Why I call it neoliberal kleptocracy? Because we had these transition policies, of course, with IMF loans that, of course, were necessary because there was no money otherwise. You get conditionality. You have to start doing neoliberal reforms. Of course they didn't want to do those reforms full sway in Ukraine. They did it at their own pace. It was almost like subversive capitalism, if you like. Ukrainian oligarchs and politicians, if, if you can differentiate them, sometimes it's difficult. It's a... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it, it's a tough one. Sometimes it's very clear because an oligarch is an MP. Uh, sometimes it's a little less clear, like you know uh, Kuchma and all of that kind of thing. But we still kind of all have an idea, don't we? Um, yeah, but what happens is that in this in this process of accumulation is that because so little is being done, something has to be thrown to the masses in order to generate consent to this regime, 
right? So we have this we have these transition reforms kind of being put in place, but they've been adapted and adopted uh, by Ukrainian ruling bloc so as to serve their own accumulation needs. Uh, they are notorious, Ukrainian oligarchs are notorious for making it very difficult for foreign TNCs to penetrate into the sectors that they find themselves interesting. That's, it, you know, the recent uh, departure of Shell, for example, amongst other things, uh, uh, it signifies again about the fact that that is still something that's going on. And that's one of the reasons, again, behind this slow progress with uh, the deep comprehensive trade agreement, which, of course, is not a very good agreement for Ukraine at all. Um, yeah, but coming back, so when we are constructing this regime of, of neoliberal kleptocracy, where very little gets thrown back to the masses and the system of reproduction is being eroded day in, day out, uh, but you have to throw something to them uh, and uh, somehow convince people that we need to carry on. And I define those uh, uh, consensualizing discourses, mechanisms, uh, mechanisms as four myths that uh, have uh, that have signified this tr transition of uh, construction of regime of neoliberal kleptocracy. It's the myth of tr transition. Uh, what it is is that we we somehow were sold this idea that transition is necessary, that USSR fell apart because we wanted capitalism, that uh, capitalism is a good system and will benefit everybody, and uh, and we have this telos of transition. We have to transition to full market. It doesn't exist, and it's not necessarily a good thing to begin with. You have to look into the specificities of state society relationships in every concrete country to see if that is an advisable thing. Again, coming back to, uh, to subsistence economy and all of that kind of thing. Next myth is the myth of democracy. You know, virtual politics and uh, paid protesters and all of that kind of thing comes to mind here. Uh, the next, uh, the next myth is the myth of two Ukraines. Like starting with the orange blue campaign, we start having this division, this manufacturing of divisions. Yes, Ukraine is not a homogenous voting, uh, homogenous territory by voter preferences. Guess what? That kind of heterogeneity is not political norm everywhere. It doesn't mean that you have that it has to result into an armed conflict. It is not an automatic relationship. And last but not least, and this is something that's emerging, emerging now, uh, and I will finish with this one. Um, uh, as a result um, of this, uh, of oligarchs in their in their fight for money and, and, and accumulation and political power, um, as a result of uh, telling people that there are two Ukraines, that Banderites hate uh, Donetsk and the other way around. This myth, they, and, you know, there are Kozli and uh, all of that kind of wonderful language. Um, what, 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 has, what we, we end up with is that there, there, there has been the other manufactured within, the, within Ukraine. And that is something that we see the kind of developing from the Orange Blue campaign and, and, and go into its crescendo into, in the events of Bloody Winter. I, I refuse to call it Revolution of Dignity. There was nothing dignifying about that, uh, not least the right-wing forces that Volodymyr will talk about later. But we're now living in that state of Bloody Winter where Ukrainians are othered from themselves, from their past. In order to claim to be Ukrainian now, you have to denounce uh, any sort of relationship with your Soviet past, any relationship with Russia. You have to denounce the language that you perhaps prefer to speak. You have to cut yourself in half, so to speak. You have to remodel yourself in some sort of crazy way, which is not necessarily a good thing either. But this last myth, this survival myth of neoliberal kleptocracy, is very shaky. Uh, and uh, the oligarchs know that they're on the borrowed time. And this is why they are absorbing, I'm, I'm finishing this, they're absorbing this right-wing rhetoric uh, of patriots, we need to be heroes and all of that kind of thing, so that they, are, they become, that, that, that helps them become immune in a way from criticism, because they know that they can have nothing else to offer. And if the conflict in the East is to die, Tomorrow, they will be the next ones to be shot, and they're perfectly aware of that. And that's why, weirdly enough, they're the most interested party in allowing for this conflict to carry on for as long as is physically possible. Thank you very Thank much. You. I'll have Thank to you. end there.